bar. I was like, what's a good snack to have before dinner? And he's like, try the scotch egg. I was like, okay, cool. So I've, I've, never, I've never had a scotch egg. So I buy the scotch egg. It's 14 pounds. And he brings it out. It's a fucking Nargisi Kofta. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> and I, I, I was living. I was like, this is 150 rupees, 200 rupees in Pakistan. I just spent 14 pounds on this. Three, two, one. What is up, you guys? And welcome back to the best podcast, to your favorite podcast. Well, hopefully we're your favorite podcast because Salmai and I are back. We're back regularly giving you guys quality ass content from the two time zones. Um, I'm sitting over here in Pakistan and, to, and today we have a very special guest. He is one of the greatest modernist, uh, modernist chefs that I know. Well, he's probably one of the only few modernist chefs that I know, but his food is fucking to die for. Um, he has worked he has worked in places like the restaurant Gordon Ramsay and he has a very 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 interesting food philosophies that we will be diving right into guys please please give a hand please give a round of applause for Hamza Hayauddin the best chef that i know so far wow <laughs> beautiful intro as always yeah. <laughs> So Hamza, what's up? Oh, not much man thank you guys for having me uh this is my first podcast so let's Let's see how this goes. Yeah. First of many, bro. You're on your way to great success, man, in this capitalist world. You're, you're, you're going to make it, man. You're going to make it. Just jam down your communistic views and, you're, and, the, and, the, rest is, the, and the rest is gold. Yeah, why not, right? <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure, man, for sure. So uh, what we want to do is we want to get like, a, like an entire overview of who you are, what you do. And um, yeah, just like, you know, and we, we just want to get an essence of you and what you're trying to bring to the world because you're because the stuff that you and I have talked about, um, talked about in person has been very, very interesting and on to be to be honest, very, very inspiring because you have inspired me to think of think of the world in a very, very different way. So I, I thought that having you as a guest on the show would have been really, really interesting. I think Salman has a few questions that, he, that he'd like to, you know, kick off the show with because I know a little bit about you, but I think Salman wants to ask you a few questions. Well, and then, yeah, so that's where we're going to go from. I kind of want to start off with a question for Saad. Saad, how do you know Hamza? Because you refused to tell me when I asked you earlier, so I, I really <laughs> need to know this. <laughs> we have a mutual friend. She's an artist. Um, Hamza hired her um, to do some branding for his work. And... Um, and I her and she lives in Lahore apparently. So when she was in Islamabad, I was like, "Yo, let's meet up." She's like, "I'm already with a friend." I'm like, "Okay, cool. Meet me. Uh, meet me afterwards." She's like, "Okay, how about you just come over to this guy's house? He's a chef. Do you know him? Chef, lawyer, and all that." I'm like, "I'm like, I've heard this name before. I, I've I've heard the name Hamza Hayauddin. I've heard the Hayauddin's name fly around around Islamabad a lot." I'm like, "Hmm, interesting. I'll I'll show up." So one night at like nine ten p.m., I just randomly show up to this guy's house. He's cooking like a full on modernistic three course cuisine. Even though I'm full, me. Being being the capitalist that I am, eating more than I can, eating more than I, you know, more than I need to, I will, I, I will eat that shit up, man. And dude, this guy came up, okay, start, start, started the dinner off with the starter being Nargisi, a modernist steak on Nargisi koftas, which was just like, you know, tomato. I think Hamza will explain it better, but I'm just going to give you like the basic overview. It was modernist steak, Nargisi koftas as starters. The main course was a filet mignon. And um, the and dessert, what was the dessert? Was it like a lemon, lemon sorbet tart. or what it was, was it? Tart, yeah. So Hamza, like, you know, you, you, you chime in. You chime in. You, you, you chime in. Start explaining the three the three course meal that you fed uh, so us. So my, my style, like, I guess I'll start off with that, is it's a modernist, progressive take on Pakistan cuisine. And I, I don't like the word modernist because like, it seems gimmicky. So I prefer progressive desi because what a progressive does is they ask questions and they see what the future and the evolution of something will be because uh, you're always evolving, you're always changing. Uh, so the first course was an Argasi Kofta Tortellini, which is a take on so you know we invented the dumplings the chinese and by like the this part of the world we have mantus the nepalese have momos chinese have dumplings the italians took them they stole them and served them as ravioli so i thought and like other stuff pasta so i was like if we can take that back and reappropriate it uh we've got you know we're taking back a part of our history our heritage and then the nargisi kofta for me is one of the ultimate scams committed by the i mean the brits committed a lot of scams but the nargisi kofta hurt me personally because uh, i was in, can, can we swear yeah, 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 yeah. so, so I, I, I was in london i went to this restaurant yeah, called <laughs> called the fat duck and it's one of the best restaurants in the uk three michelin stars and i asked the guy at the bar i was like what's a good snack to have before dinner and he's like try the scotch egg I was like, okay, cool. So I've, I've, never, I've never had a scotch egg. So I buy the scotch egg. It's 14 pounds. And he brings it out. It's a fucking Nargisi Kofta. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> and I, I, I was living. I was like, this is 150 rupees, 200 rupees in Pakistan. I just spent 14 pounds on this. 
Uh, so I wanted to take those two things back and design them in a progressive way, which became a tortellini uh, made of egg yolk uh, pasta stuffed with the Nargisi kofta mince and served with a tomato chutney. So it's the same ingredients of the kofta, but it's redesigned in a new way. So you get familiar flavors, but a new textural combination. That sounds really good. Like, and also just continue, like, man. Like, <laughs> genius. Wow. Continue, continue, continue with the with, with the main course. So the main course, I, I just had leftover steak. Left. I asked these guys what they wanted, and they said, uh, you know, she said, uh, Mahin's a friend we had in common. And she's like, steak is fine. So I had some yeah. on left over. So I had dry aged uh, some of the fat for it. Just served that up, uh, almost like a namkin gosh. So all it was seared with was a salt, pepper, garlic, and onion. So you don't need much for a good meat. So it's just that. But rather than namkin gosh being like, you know, a rump or silver side that's cooked for a, like a whole day, this was done for two hours, and it's like a really prime cut of steak. So you're getting really basic flavors into an exquisite cut of meat. So you get that te- that succulent texture plus a very comforting home cooked style flavor. Yeah. Yeah. And then the dessert was uh, my take on a lemon tart. So a lemon tart is what like a, a tart based treat filled with like some lemon fi- uh, jelly filling, and then sometimes topped with a bit of jam or like a little bit of meringue. Uh, so this was a cookie butter base using candy biscuits. Again preface that with i only use local ingredients so everything is locally sourced and yeah. nothing's imported yeah because again why are you going to put our money in some white boy's pocket when we can imp- empower local businessmen yes. uh and i'm sure some capitalist somewhere yes. is crying about this <laughs> it's how we do oh my god oh my no god. no <laughs> what about my doritos what about my doritos uh, so instead of using Bis- biscoff or lotus cookie butter i got candy biscuits and you emulsify that into cookie butter base yeah. Yeah. uh top it off with like a homemade lemon curd uh, on top of that is a lemon basil frozen yogurt and then topped with a orange meringue that's dude. torched. Dude, it was stunning. I saw the torching. That was like the most, that was like the, that was, that was like the, that sounds very nice. That was like the most amazing part of the show. I, I like the, sh- I like the showmanship when it comes to food. Like, you know, like the, like the act and the performance that, that, that that's also like really, really cool to me. I have a picture of every meal I've cooked in the last like, yeah. 12 months probably. And I cook multiple times a week. So, you know. I, I understand what you mean by showmanship. Do you follow like your progression as a cook when you compare like the first couple meals to the last couple? It's yes, in a way. Like I, I know I'm adding more stuff, and it's kind of like a baseline where I don't look back at pictures. But when it, once I take a picture, when I take another picture, I know okay, the last one looked a lot less interesting than this, so I'm doing something right. Yeah. But okay, I do. <laughs> Sorry, I do want to jump to a question that like has been on my mind since the moment Saad said we have a chef coming on with us. And that's, um, there are a lot of movies I've seen that portray the life of a chef as extremely intense, like more intense than anything else. I saw a movie Burn just oh, back yeah. in Bradley 2016 Cooper. or so. Yeah, it was, it was insane. That movie was like as intense as something like Whiplash, you know? And I just want to know, like, there's a lot of cursing, screaming, fighting, a lot of stress, a lot of competition uh, portrayed in that movie. And how does that relate to real life as a chef? So, I mean, it, it's interesting because uh, certain parts were very true to life and certain parts weren't. And the bits that weren't true to life, like, I remember this one scene where, like, uh, one of the female chefs, Sienna Miller's character, she burns herself on a, on a pot. And everyone stops and turns around to, like, be, no, let me look at that, let me get you a bandage. And in a real kitchen, that doesn't happen. Like, you burn yourself, the chef's usually yelling at you, like, you're a fucking idiot, why'd you do this? Go fix your shit. Uh, like, just yesterday, I actually cut my thumb, a whole chunk of it off. Uh, and oh, everyone else freaked oh, out. Fuck. I, just, like, I, I, oh, I wrapped it, and I went right back to cooking, because, like, when it's ser- like, in prep, you get a little bit of leeway. In service, it's full gas. Uh, you don't have any time to stop. So that bit was false, but uh, historically, there has been a very angry, hostile kitchen environment. It's not at all fun to work with. It's quite toxic. Uh, there's now steps being taken to shift away from that, but like, it's fairly true to form. Like Marcus Waring, I think helped direct, uh, the, the kitchen scenes and he's one of the best chefs in the world. So like, he knows what it's like to work in those restaurants. Like when I was at Ramsey, we were working 20 hour shifts sometimes. Wow. That's, and that I think should bring us to the next point, which is, um, Saad told me you've worked a lot of great places, including at one of Gordon Ramsey's restaurants. So how about you expand a bit on that? Uh, yeah. So my yeah. first. Should I rewind with like, how I started as a chef or talk about the restaurants themselves? Ooh, you know what? No, that, that is a good idea. I think I have these questions back. Let's start with uh, how you started out as a chef. <laughs> I heard you were a lawyer. And that's an interesting yeah, career. Yeah, yeah. Let's start from the top. And Let's start just off with to the top. add to that, um, 
before you start. Oh, that's a nice dog in someone's background. But, no, you're good. You're good. Um, so I know a lot of people go to culinary schools and spend a lot of time working their way into being a chef. Um, you, on the other hand, started out as a lawyer who then left his profession. So how did that work out? How did you manage to break into the professional chef scene? Well, what I'm assuming is less experience and less exposure. Yeah, that was actually the biggest barrier for me. I wanted to be a chef when I was like uh, 20, 21. I graduated undergrad and I talked to my mom and they were like, oh, do you want to be a lawyer? Do you want to be a doctor? You know, which would you like to be? And I thought about it. I was like, you know what? I'd really like to be a chef. Like I want to go to culinary school. And both my parents freaked out. Uh, and they were like, Hansama banoge, uh, and the deal with my mom then was she was like, if you go to law school and practice for two years, you can do whatever you want. And I was like, no, I was like, if I practice for, if I go to law school, I'll practice for one year, and then you pay for my culinary school. And she's like, okay, deal. So I went uh, to law school. I practiced for a year after graduating. I got my law license. Uh, and afterwards, I was like, are you happy? And she's like, yeah. I was like, okay, cool. Quit my job. I was like, now I'm going to be a chef. Uh, and I started doing research on culinary schools. And the cheapest one was like, I think, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, all things considered. And it just seemed like a really bad investment given what kind of skills they teach you. So it's really good in some ways if you're not a self-starter. But if you're willing to do the grunt work and teach yourself, especially like with the internet now, you've got YouTube, you've got, you know, master classes, you've got yeah. all these books and you've yeah, got yeah. the world's best chefs available on Instagram, like at the touch of your fingers. So you can reach out to them. So I was like, why don't I just go and learn from the best? So I was in Bangkok. Uh, for, well, I worked here in a restaurant for six weeks and I was just, I was in the weeds. Like I was so swamped. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. It was my first ever job. And they gave me a head chef gig and I was like, fuck this. So I was like, I'm going to leave. I'm going to go and learn from the best. So I went to Bangkok and I walked into Guggen, uh, which at that point was number four in Asia. No, number one in Asia, number four in the world. And I was like, hey, I want to work for you. And they're like, do you have an appointment? And I was like, nah. And I, they're like, do you have any experience? And I was like, nah. And he's like, do you have any, if, he's like, do you have any equipment? And I was like, nah. And he's like, and he's, like he's just like, the guy's floored. Like, and he calls me back. The chef comes out. I was like, listen, I don't have any experience, I don't have anything, but I will work for free. I'll, I'll stay here as long as you want. I just want to learn. Uh, he's, like, he's like, can you get knives? I was like, yeah, I'll get knives uh, tomorrow. He's like, okay, start tomorrow. Before this, I've never worked in a pro cat kitchen. So I just walk, the next so, morning I walk in, yeah. I'm, I'm lost. And these I, are like the best cooks in the think, world. I'm, amazing. Uh, I think, I, 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 I think... I, I think I, wait, wait, first of all when I think there's a this? lesson that all of you guys were watching that can be taken from this you, the biggest barrier to you achieving your fucking dreams guys is not you actually not having qualifications you not having the balls to actually go out and ask for what you want this guy had the balls to go out go out and ask at Asia's number one restaurant with zero experience and he fucking got through I mean like if this guy can do it if I if I can do it in the future hopefully like you know make it big and all that but th- if this guy can do it if if anybody can do it, guys, anybody, you just need to like, you know, strap up, strap your boots up and be willing to work and just go, go and get your dreams, guys. Literally just shoot your shot. That's that simple. Like the worst case scenario of shooting your shot is you get, you get, shoot your shot. That's it. Yeah, exactly. Come on. So just to be clear, you walked into this restaurant and who exactly did you talk to? Was it just some random waitress or like, you know, someone serving tables who was like, oh, you want to, how did that, how does that work? Who do you talk to who decides to get you a meeting with the chef instead of just picking you out on the street? So I went and talked to the food manager. I went in and I was like, hi. Uh, I saw a waitress first. I, like, I want a stage. And she's like, okay. Uh, she calls the front of house manager. Uh, and he comes out and I was like, I want, to, I, want to be, I want a stage. I want to be an apprentice. And he's like, he's the one who asked me all the questions. And he and I just, it, first he saw me sitting there for like 30, 45 minutes. And he came over and finally he was free and started talking. And uh, he's like, okay, the chef's busy right now. He'll be back in a bit. And I was like, okay. Uh, he's like, yeah, yeah. I had a book, so I was like, I'll just sit here and read if that's okay. And he's like, yeah. I waited almost like I think an hour and a half or so until they were done. Oh. And they came out. Uh, <laughs> and it was, it was their lunch break, basically. So that's why they were, they were cool with it. Uh, on, like, if it was in the middle of service, he would have probably been like, fuck off, kid. Uh, but because they're all going on break, I was like by the entrance. So as he came out, he sat with me for like five minutes and all this happened. Uh, but yeah, like, I just t- talked to the F&B manager first. Like he, came, so, like he came out and I was like, we started talking about random stuff and created like a pretty, pretty good rapport within a couple minutes. Uh, and that's where it happened. Because initially, if I just opened up with, I want to work for you, it would have been like this. So he started talking about something else, and we started segueing yeah. into it. And I was like, oh, where are you from? You know, your accent, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and that led to then the next step. Yeah. So I think establishing a rapport yeah. and finding that common ground really helps. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
All right, so, Savan, what else do you have? What else, what else, do, you have? What else do you want to ask? Like, yeah. We have the little list of questions. So, like, yeah, yeah. do you want to transition into... Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, the second continue. part, then yeah. Ramsey worked out kind of similarly, but uh, there was... So after a Guggen, I realized I did not know anything about food, and that freaked me out. I was like, it's like I've been there two months at that point. I had to go back to London uh, to connect to Pakistan, and I was like, you know what? Why don't I start my trip here? So one of my, one of my friends is, in my opinion, the best chef in Pakistan by far. She's worked at some of the top restaurants. Like right now, she's at 11 Madison Park. Before that, she was at Yoel Robuchon. Like, just, like, she's worked among the gods. Like, that's like, that's like if you've gone to, like, Mount Olympus and, like, worked there at God School. Uh, so I was like, hey, I'm in London. What do you suggest I do? And she's like, go work for Ramsey. And I was like, Haha, yeah, fuck you. And then she's like, no, no, seriously. She's, 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 like, she's like, you're here anyway. You might as well apply. She, she's an apprentice at Ramsey, so that's how she knew the chef. And I was like, no, I, uh, they're, like, they're not going to let me in. Are you kidding me? She's like, you just got dug in. I was like, yeah, but Ramsey's a different category. So what she does is she emails the chef behind my back and says, hey, chef, I've got this friend who's in town. He wants to apprentice for like a couple of weeks. Uh, is that cool? And the chef CCs me and replies back to me. And then she's like, hey, dumbass, yeah. check your email. I check my email. And the chef is like, can you start tomorrow? <laughs> oh my god. And I'm just like, oh. <laughs> oh uh, my so god. I, and I was like, well, I, mean, I guess I have to. So I messaged her. I was like, hey, well played. Thank you. I turn up the next day. Uh, he's like, he's like, get here at 6 a.m. The place is an hour and a half to two hours away from where I'm staying. Because I'm staying way out in the boonies and it's in Chelsea. So mm. it takes me like two, mm. I have to wake up at four to get there. Get there at six. First day, it's like full gas. I get my ass kicked. I'm leaving at midnight. And like by the second day, I'm like, I'm going to quit. It's insane. Because I, I leave at midnight. I get home at 2 a.m. I have like an hour and a half of sleep max. Wake up the next day, still in my mm. chef's whites, brush my teeth and get out the door again. Uh, what? Like, I hadn't showered in like three days, the first three days. And I was going to quit every single day because like you just feel your body breaking. And I toughed it out. At the, yeah. at the yeah. end of my first week, I had a job offer from Matt Abbe of Gordon Ramsay being like, come work for us. And I'm just like, oh. Whoa. Whoa. And at one point, they were getting Dude, this me. chef life is intense. Wow. I was way out of my comfort zone because like, I thought, so Guggen I really liked because Guggen is not like burnt. It was super chill. People are playing. The only rule was no rap music. He'd play rock. He's a big Foo Fighters fan. So we listen like all oh, the shit. We'd be dancing and partying and having fun. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a rock star. Uh, like, you know, and 15 minutes before mm -hmm. service, when everyone else is like in fire mode, he's outside in the garage playing drums, or, like in, in the street playing cricket. Like, no. he's, he's so great. No. So, <laughs> so to go from that chilled environment to like the full gas of restaurant Gordon Ramsay, which is like the movie in Burnt, which is like the movie Burnt. Uh, I was just like, I'm peeling carrots and it's too slow. I'm peeling grapes and it's too slow. No matter what I'm doing, like I'm 10 steps behind. And, and I'm like, hey, Jeff, is there a trick to peeling these carrots? And she's like, yeah, move your hands faster. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. One of the chefs oh. on the side and he's like, hey, dude, what's, what's your problem? Why are you so slow? And I was like, well, chef, I've only been cooking for three months. And he's like, what? Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I was like, I'm sorry. And he's, like, he's, like, he's like, where were you before? I was like, Duggan. He's like, where were you before that? I was like, Pakistan. He's like, why did you... And he's like, he's like, why'd you choose Gordon Ramsay? And I was like, here's the thing. If you want to learn to hunt, you go up to the lions. You don't go learning from like a YouTube video. Like you go into the lions and like, hey, Mufasa yeah. just want to hunt. Uh, or Sarabi, technically speaking, yeah. because lionesses hunt. Uh, so then after that, when they realized that, they started respecting me a lot more. And like, okay, you know, this guy, this guy is passionate. He just doesn't know. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, that's yeah. when the job offer came in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, here's where we want to talk about the philosophy oh, for, philosophy of food. Cool. We're gonna we're gonna quickly transition to your philosophy of food and what do you want from food? What do you hate about the food culture? Because I know a little bit about it. I want the audience to know what you love and what you hate about the culture. Let's go, communist. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> I'm gonna make so many enemies now. <laughs> no, 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 no. You won't. Do you, you know? Do you know? You, the entire thing is the entire thing. The entire philosophy of our podcast is to be authentic, transparent, and just be you. People are either gonna love you or they're gonna hate you, dude. That's not. That's not your. That's not for you to decide. It's just for your job is just to be authentic. Let's go. Uh, the biggest thing I realized working in a restaurant is that I <laughs> hate restaurant life. I hate the culture. I hate the fact that it's always so aggressive. That it's always rushed. That it's always hectic. Uh, I don't like the way communication happens. I don't like the exploitation that occurs because like you're working 100 hours a week and getting paid for maybe 40 of them. Like if you yeah. break down, like, let's say the best restaurants will pay you 1,500 pounds a month for theoretically a 40-hour week. When you break it into a 100-hour week, you're making two, three pounds an hour working 20-hour days. It's, yeah. it's grueling. So I, as you know, the socialist I am, wanted to remove all that capitalistic bullshit with the lowest common denominator who matters, the bottom lines what matters. And I wanted to focus on people getting 
you know, people getting paid for their time, not working ridiculous hours. I want good ingredients coming in. I want the farmers to not be, uh, be exploited for their products or paying above market rates. Like I want to redefine what cuisine entails without exploitation. Like a lot of these fucking vegans will be like, oh, you know, our food's cruelty free. It's like, no, it's not. Your quinoa was picked by a migrant in Peru who cannot feed his family now because you're eating his crops. You know, so it's like, I get really pissed seeing this white social justice happening around the world. It's like, dude, if you're going to be committing to it, you have to like go back and do a new agricultural and culinary revolution. So that's what spurred it was like seeing, you know, it's like when you've been through some shit, you're like, I don't want to experience that again or I don't want other people to go through that. That's what happened. I was like, I don't want to run restaurants the way I've worked in restaurants so far. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think the biggest thing is like, I don't like, I think the biggest scam Goraz gave us, again, there's a lot of scams. But like one, another thing is like, telling us that our cuisine, our culture is not sophisticated, it's not refined, uh, that it's like somehow less than, like why is a fine dining restaurant, you know, white tablecloths and like pinkies out and like using the right fork and the right yeah. spoon. I it's agree like, with that, that It's like, dude, lick the plate, mm-hmm. laugh out loud, drop the plate, communal sharing, eat with your hands. Like that's the fun of eating. It's a visceral experience. You smell yeah. it, you see it, you feel it, then you taste it. Yeah. Uh, so I want to redesign that and I was like, what is the most authentic way of doing that for me was when I was in Bangkok, street food. And that reminded me of Pakistan. Like the best food you get in Pakistan is Dhaba food or like Karka Khana. Yeah. I agree. For sure. It's, be- it's because of the, it's because of the culture that, that is, that is established and it's because of the entire environment that you're around. And, um, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. I totally agree with that. And the people that work in those environments, like, you know, the Jai Valas who work in the Dhabas, they've honed their craft. They're not trying to be McDonald's. They'll do one thing ex- exquisitely well. Like Azad Bun Kebab on Burns Road, best burger in Pakistan. Why? Because he's making Bun Kebab since 57. Like that dude's recipe is impe- impeccable. Uh, TRP here is making paratha rolls for 40 years. Even before Islam was a yeah. thing, he's making rolls in Syria. So like, that's what I wanted to bring. I wanted to bring that authenticity, not authenticity. I don't like that word so much. I wanted to bring that genuine love for cooking. I want to bring the soul back into it because we've lost that. Uh, yeah. and then what, I, I like modernism. I like the science of cooking, uh, cooking. I like chemistry. I like the psychology. So that naturally drew me. And that's the first couple of restaurants I worked at were ones that were pushing the envelope of what it means. Because I don't want to gentrify our cuisine. Like I don't want, like, you know, my biggest thing when I eat food, I don't like it. It's like, like, don't charge me 150 rupees extra for like a roll that I get on the street for so much less unless you're anything novel to it. So I want to redesign our cuisine. And the way that looks for me is like, I'll take a, a dish, like let's say uh, a paratha roll, right? What is a paratha roll? A paratha roll is a paratha and meat rolled up. So you explode that into its components. What is a paratha? It's a dough of disc. How can you make that different? What is what is chicken? Chicken is a protein. Can it be changed? Why is it chicken boti? Could it be handi? Could it be something else? Uh, you know, how is a paratha roll different from a burrito? You're starting these crossovers in your head with other cuisines and you redesign it. Uh, so if I was to make a new paratha roll, you know, why would it even look like a paratha roll? What if I could do a chicken skin that's been stuffed with breaded chicken and uh, like that's been deep fried? So it's almost like a reverse zinger served inside crispy yeah. chicken skin. So you get the yeah. same flavor of a paratha roll, but like in a whole new way. Or yeah. like imagine biting into a drumstick and a drumstick tastes like a paratha roll because it's got the bread on the inside now. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. wow. Dude, that's a great idea. Dude, I want, I want to try that right. next time I come over to your place. I'm having that. I'm having that. I'm having that next time I come over to your place. I, I, I want to see that implemented. Is, you know, like, I like, I like the, the little magic. Like, you know, when you watch a magic trick, I used to love magic as a kid. And that's yeah. time, to your point, Salman, about like, the theatricality of food. Uh, it has to yeah. be a spectacle. It has to be, you know, remember like those Turkish ice cream guys like play with the yeah. cone and they jab yeah, and yeah. stuff? I want yeah. that. I want that delight. So like when you see a magic trick, it's good. The first thing is there's the promise, which is like, you're going to, yeah, I'm going to do something cool to dazzle you. Then there's the performance. And then there's the reveal, which is like, this is how it happened. And that aha yeah. moment when you're like, oh, shit. I want to give people that. Oh, yeah, so I don't yeah. want to give them food. I want to give them memories and experiences. Yeah, dude, dude, trust me. With that that night that I came so, over to your house, that was one of the most memorable food nights that I've had because I learned so much from you, like from the very little tiniest components when it comes to food to massive things and all that, dude. It was it was just insane. And um, Salman, this guy can also break down a chicken blindfolded. I saw it on his Instagram stories. This guy was blindfolded and he broke down an entire fucking chicken blindfolded. He knows his shit. He oh, knows his God. shit. Salman. <laughs> yeah. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so the other day, I was trying to redo it because I did it in like two minutes last time. And I want to do it even faster, 45 seconds. So I sharpened my knife and I put the blindfold on. I put the blindfold on, I sharpened my knife and I start cutting. And I'm having trouble cutting mm-hmm. into the chicken. And I'm like, why? I just sharpened this. 
And I take off the blindfold and I realize I'm holding the knife upside down and it's cut in my finger and I'm using the dull end to cut the chicken. And since it's so sharp, I haven't felt it cut in my finger and I'm just like, oh, oh my God. Blood and, blood. and I'm like, oh my God. Oh. <laughs> but barring that, I did, oh I did get it blindfolded, God. yeah. That is beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Saman, uh, would you want to ask, do you want to do you want to talk yeah, a few things? So, yeah, so well, we are, we've run way over how long we normally go, but I will say there's still so much more I'd love to talk about. So this is definitely a good starting point for another episode where I bring you back and ask you even more questions about the movie Burton and about your life. Um, yes. But the last thing I want to know yes. before we sign off is, um, one, if someone wanted to eat your food right now, where would they find it? Where could they find you? So I'm on Instagram at eat.hurak, K-H-O-R-A-K. Uh, it feels like Yito, like, you know, the link's up here, but I'm, can you just put a link up here somewhere? <laughs> link in the description um, down below. I know, guys, smash that subscribe button, guys. Uh, Hell yeah. <laughs> eat Hurak is the main one. Uh, I also take orders via WhatsApp. Uh, right now, though, I do private catering, so that's the main way to get my food. Uh, I, I'm gonna start supper clubs again once the quarantine lifts. I was gonna do a food truck, which was in the pipeline. That's not been pushed till the summer because of uh, coronavirus. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but what I have started right now is a, an, a seasonal sorbet business it's using exclusively locally sourced fruits that come from farmers that I've handpicked to have, that have good produce. Uh, and it's called Sharbat. Uh, Sharbat. And like the logo is like a little booty. Yeah, because like a joke on sorbet, Sharbat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I like to push the envelope. <laughs> I, why does food have to be polite? You know, make it uncomfortable. Serve discomfort food. Serve food that's delightful and starts uncomfortable conversations. Uh, yeah. and silliness yeah. so it's, it's seasonal sorbet it's available by eat Hurak. eat Hurak also has my menu per se which is like basically it's an ode to the creative process it's so like there's never a set menu i don't serve the same thing twice uh the meal is a collaboration you tell me what you like i'll ask about your life stories uh your experiences and i'll tailor a meal for you based on that that is beautiful that is beautiful and on that bombshell and on that bombshell guys we will definitely have hamza back to talk about his food truck adventures and that'll be the part that that'll be the part two but like yeah anyways guys i think we're done for this one peace adios bye-bye thank you guys